Amen. Well, good morning, church. How many of you know storms come in different sizes and shapes, and they look differently, don't they? Sometimes you know a storm is coming, you can see it, and it just is moving in your direction. And then there are other times where storms just surprise you. They just, all of a sudden, you're in the middle of it, and you don't know how you got there. Now, all you Midwesterners, you all know about the tornadoes. How many of you from there? Yeah, see, you saw the tornadoes come in, and somehow there's a comfort knowing that they're coming, and I can run and hide. And so then you laugh at all the Californians who live in Earthquakeville, and then the earthquake, we're just happy and dumb, and then it happens, and we're shocked, and we're, it just happened, right? But some people don't like to just have a storm hit them by surprise. They'd rather live in the Midwest to see that dude coming so they can brace for it, you know what I'm saying? But, but storms come in many different ways. It's in when you and I get into a situation where life gets overwhelming and the storm of life happens, we get into a position where we're desperately trying to save or fix the problem and we start drowning or suffocating within that storm. How many of you know that's true? If, if, if you think about it, has there been an emotional or relational financial situation where you literally thought you were being strangled, you were, you were running out of air, the weight of it was just overwhelming, and that's where ulcers come from, amen? They come from storms of life. Sometimes you walk into a storm, and you're just there, and you go, oh boy, how do, how do I solve this? When we go to Mexico, it's always a unique situation because we bring in a thousand people, and they come into this building, and we, we pray over them, and we ask uh, ask them to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And many times, three or four hundred of them will raise their hand and say, I, I want Jesus to be part of my life. I want to be adopted, and I want to be a son or daughter of God. And that's a fabulous moment. And we do that, and it's great. And then we turn around and we say, if you have uh, some problems with your health or you need prayer, we would like you to come forward. Well, when you have a thousand people in the room and three or four hundred of them come to the front, you feel like you're, you're in the middle of a storm. There's 300 people who need desperate help, who have no health care, who have all kind of issues and health issues going on in their life. And you're out there going, Lord, I opened my mouth. I'm in the middle of this storm. You're going to have to help me. You're just going to have to help me. And Lord... Here, here's the problem with this that I, I get most frustrated with is I would love to spend time with all 300 and I just can't physically do that quick enough because there's another thousand people that are going to come into this building as soon as I, I channel these people out into the parking lot where we give them shoes and food and send them home or running in another group. And so it's like, Lord, I, I need to just pray fast over people and I need to bless them, and I need your Holy Spirit to do what I can't possibly do by myself, and I just need you to just bless. And so we, we do get 20, 30 people as prayer team up front, so that's about 10 people. To, if each prayer person prays over 10 people, you know, you can get there in a short amount of time, but that's the challenge, and I remember uh, in the middle of the situation, I, I need an interpreter while I'm down there. Uh, I know how to order tacos and burritos. And I say totos. I get everything on it. And then I just pick off whatever I don't want. And that's how I function in Mexico. If I need to have a deep conversation, I need somebody with me. So I have this 17-year-old uh, this girl. I just recruited her. I said, sweetheart, you're going to have to interpret for me. And she, she just barely knows church. She don't know much. And she goes, oh, no, 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 pastor. You know, I can't pray. I said, listen, I'm praying. You just, you just repeat what I say. So we're going to go through, and I'm going to grab, you know, we're just going to go through about 20, 30 people, and all, everybody's going to be doing this, I need you to help me. And this elderly came, lady came in, and she was a grandmother, and for whatever reason, her grandkids weren't working. She was the provider for the home financially. She had been working for many years, and she was riddled with arthritis. And the pain was constant in her, her body, just constant. And as she began to talk about it, she began to cry. And so I... Uh, this little girl's interpreted me and for me, and I said, well, we're going to pray, and we're going to ask God to heal you. Uh, we're going to ask him to heal you so you get healthy, and then we're, I'm going to pray that your boys get a job, and then you go home, and you don't work no more. That's the other thing I prayed for. And so, so this little girl's helping me. I go, Jesus' name, 
through the power of the Holy Spirit from the top of her head to the bottom of her toes. Just, just right now, just go through there and just take away the pain and heal her of this arthritis throughout her entire body. And uh, the little girl goes, <laughs> she's giving it all she's got. And she's looking at me like, what are we doing? You know, I'm not a pastor. I'm just, I just said what he said. That's all I know. And she, she puts her hand on her. And while we're doing this, the lady just melts and begins to cry and just begins to weep. And then she, in her broken tears, this grandmother says, I haven't not known pain for the last 15 years. And I've just been completely healed. And in that moment, my little 17-year-old girl just starts bawling. And she don't know what to think. All she knows is she got dragged into this. I grab a local and just say, you just let's go, let's do this. And they don't know what they're doing. They're just riding with me, you know. And so I said, so this is good. I said, sweetheart, I need you to stop crying because we got 30 more people to go after. <laughs> We got, we got to keep moving. We, I, I mean, it, it's, and, it, and it's, it's, it's emotional. I mean, we prayed for a kid down there who was in a wheelchair that just shook and, and couldn't even get out of the wheelchair, and they had to keep him from falling out of the wheelchair. We prayed for him for the last uh, three years in a row. Last year, he walked into the building. He's, uh, yeah, give God a hand, hand clap of praise. Amen. He walked into the building. I mean, this guy was in a wheelchair. He had a cerebral palsy, I believe it was. It was so bad he couldn't communicate. He had no muscle control, and he walked into the building. And, of course, we brought him up on stage and told everybody, you know, how wonderful this was and that we serve an amazing God. But it's moments like that where you're in a storm, and you have to recognize, Lord, I need you to save me. I need you. I'm, I'm going to do whatever you ask me to do. But this storm is bigger than me. I recognize it and I confess that I need you. I need a savior. And, and I think what's interesting is we all know the storms of life keep coming in our life. They come in different looks and different shapes. And we just had a disaster, a fire disaster. People are in the, the storm of rebuilding. And that is a storm. Uh, paperwork, insurance, all the things that go along with that. You have people that are still in the aftermath of divorce, the aftermath of a broken family, the aftermath of a lost loved one, and the aftermath of financial ruin. And you're living in the storm. And God says, I need you to come to me and say, I need you, Lord, I need you. This is something that I need your help with. It is amazing that the Lord says, I want to grow your faith. I want to grow your trust level in our relationship. And, you know, in order to develop trust in a relationship, there has to be what I always use the, the expression or the analogy is, there has to be long-term consistent behavior builds trust, okay? In any marriage, family, relationship, child, kid, kid to child, when there is long-term consistent behavior, then the foundation of trust in the relationship is being built. And that foundation is either being built or it's being torn down, but it never just stays. To the degree that I manage my relationship with my wife consistently and in a way of integrity, I'm putting bricks and the foundation of trust that are strong and they reinforce the relationship. And it would take an enormous storm to knock over my building. But when there's very few bricks, when I've mistreated her or there's not transparency in her relationship, there are areas of my life that are off limits to her to where I don't let her in, then those are areas that are vulnerable. That's an area of weakness. That's an area where my wife's not sure if she can trust me because she just doesn't know because I've been unwilling to be transparent with. And when we talk about rebuilding relationships and trust and having faith and having peace in a relationship, we're talking about long-term consistent behavior. If my wife has all the passwords to my phone, she has all the passwords to everything I have. A matter of fact, she's more in charge of what I have than I am. And we got to talk about that later after church. In Jesus' name, help me. Amen. And, and, and it's... 
it's because of that, if you were to ask her a question about me, she would have an answer in every area of my life. And so that's, that's building trust. But did you know, there are these storms that come our way, and in the midst of the storm or the difficult season is a great moment to build a stronger relationship. It's also a great moment to blow a relationship completely up, <laughs> right? So it's in a dangerous moment, a storm comes in a relationship or financial storm comes and it starts to weaken the foundation of a relationship. And then we get distrustful of the one we're with and what did you do with our money and what happened here and what happened there. And it's in that moment that if I can open up and say this is exactly what I attempted to do and this is the motive behind what I did, then you can say, well then let's work together, let's figure it out and God's going to get us through this. Or we get to a spot where I don't want to tell you what I did, I'm embarrassed, I'm prideful, I don't, I don't want you to know, and now there's a division in the relationship. Now there's a lack of trust, because trust is doing life together in the storm and out of the storm. It's doing life through the storm with somebody. Let me, here's a secret, but the people that you love dearly that you want a close relationship with, they're going to choke really bad <laughs> somewhere in the relationship. Have, have you figured that out? They're not going to do well. And you have a great opportunity to go, you know what? You didn't do well. <laughs> but I'm sticking out, it out with you. I'm gonna, let's, let's figure out how to get through this. Yeah, you blew our money. You did something really stupid. But here, here's the deal. In order for trust to be rebuilt... You have to make a commitment. They have to make a commitment. I'm going to try to never do that again. And then on the other side, you have to say, listen, you can trust me. When you make mistakes, I'm going to walk in and together. We'll walk out of it together. And it's in that moment when somebody forgives you and recognizes you're in and over your head and you've made a terrible mistake. And they say, I forgive you. I forgive you. Let's do this. And the trust and the security of that relationship goes boom. But you also have the opportunity to say, I'm never going to trust you again. You hurt me deeply. You're an untrustworthy person. And from here on out, I'm going to create distance in our relationship. Intimacy, which is really just relational closeness. And then the foundation of the relationship begins to erode and fall away. Well, the great opportunity of the storms of life was that God begins to act kindly towards you he begins to act in a graceful way towards you and then he begins to do something that nobody else can do right before your very eyes so we're going to go into this passage and Jesus is talking about these different stories of, I shouldn't say stories these are events in Jesus's life he, and they're being described by the writer Matthew and throughout the 7th, 8th, and ninth chapter of the book of Matthew, it talks about the amazing power that Jesus has. So if you and I are in a relationship with Jesus Christ, he has this amazing power. And the more that I embrace the power that he has and his willingness to use that in our relationship to strengthen it, the more comforting it is. If I look through those <clears throat> through chapter 8 there was a leper that came to Jesus and in his despair being shunned by everybody Jesus says I'm going to demonstrate that I have the power over despair I will not only heal him but I will take away his shame and he will now have a relationship with other people because if you had leprosy you were on the out so he shows his his power over despair there was a, a, a mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law was deathly sick and she had a disease. And Jesus said, I have power over disease. I have a power over despair. I have power over disease. And he walked over and I love this part. He touches her hand and he says, be healed. And she's completely healed. She gets up and goes and makes some dinner. Hey man, wouldn't you love to do that to your wife? Hey Amen. When she was sick, heal her and then she gets you dinner. Okay, that didn't work. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
Can we edit that from the tape? I don't think Lisa's in kids' ministries today. <laughs> there was a paralytic man who, who couldn't even get to Jesus. And Jesus says, I have the power over difficult situations. There was a, a daughter of an official uh, ranking officer of that time, and, and Jesus raised that daughter from the dead. Jesus has power over death. There was two blind men, and, and they, they weren't believing they could be healed. Jesus has the power over doubt. He has the power of the mute. He has power over dumbness. He has the power over disaster. This, this chapter, if you were to read through it, you would see, okay, he has the power to heal, power over difficulties, power over despair. He has all these, and he's trying to describe to you and me that you and I need to cling to him in the middle of the storm and not get upset with him. Did you know you can get upset with Jesus about not handling your life right? You can get upset with Jesus because there's a storm in your life and you're just going, this isn't fair. Jesus says, no, no, no just wait, wait, watch this. This is great. This is great. And you go, no, this isn't great. <laughs> this isn't great at all. I just want everybody to be happy. I want a happy marriage. I want happy kids. I want to go to Disneyland. Amen. Thank you. Uh, that's for my wife. I want to go to Disneyland, the happiest place where I want to just have fun. And I don't want no problems. Did you know that in a problem-free world, there would never be a need for you to trust somebody? Right? See, it's in the difficult times where I need help that trust is built. And, and Jesus says, listen, you can trust me. And the problem in our relationship is not on my side of the relationship. It's on your side. I'm perfect. <laughs> I love you. And if you'll just do it my way and let me help you, this will be amazing. So let's read this story. And it's about our Savior in the storm. It's in Matthew 8, 23. And as we read this, I want you to consider this. Jesus has been... On the shore all day long, he's been healing people. He's been teaching. He's been casting out demons out of people. It's just been this all-day church service, and there's hundreds and thousands of people, and he's healing people, and he's, he's exhausted. And uh, it, it, it is very emotional and difficult when you do ministry. I, I don't know why that is, but when you preach and you pray over people, I guess you're, you're dealing with all of their hurts and emotions and you desperately want to fix it for them and you're praying with them and sometimes you, you go home as a, a minister and you're just overwhelmed because you care about them. You just wish you could make it go away in two seconds and it doesn't always work like that. But Jesus had been doing this. He was completely exhausted and he said, listen, this could go on forever. I have got to get some rest. We're going to get in a boat and we're going to go across the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is similar to Lake Berryessa. It really is a lake, and it's a large lake, but you can see the other side. And while I was visiting there a couple years ago when we went to Israel, they told us that there's this north uh, westerly wind. I think it was a northwesterly wind that will come in and very quickly just create these waves that are just tremendous. And there, it's, it can be very scary to be in a small boat out on, on the ocean. Well, Jesus said, listen, in order to escape these thousands of people, we can't walk around the shoreline. We can't go. They just follow us. We're going to get in the boat and we're going to get out of here. So he gets the disciples. They all get in the boat and they start to take off. And while they're taking off, one of these storms that just creeps up out of the blue begins to happen in the ocean while they're in this boat. And what I want you to consider is that that they're in this boat, the disciples, and they're with Jesus, and they're in close relationship with him, and this storm happens. But Jesus is with them in the middle of the storm. Jesus is going to solve the problem of the storm in an amazing way, and the only ones that will know about it, listen to me, the only ones that will know about it are the ones who kept going to church regularly, who kept praying and talking to Jesus, those that were close to Jesus saw something so amazing that it filled them with a mound of bricks. I can trust this guy. This guy's amazing. Here's what's also true. Jesus did an amazing thing in this story in stopping the storm, but nobody on the shore knew it was him. Nobody from the shoreline was giving him credit. Their relationship at a distance, not bringing, uh, not, them not being 
close to him in the storm, he solved it, and they had no idea that he was that amazing of a Savior, that he had that ability. And so they missed out, if you will, on their relationship, their faith growing, their trust in him. Because here's what happens. When you go through one storm and God takes you through it, the next time a storm that size comes your way, you're going, ah, we got this. See, that's trust. We got this. We can do this. Now, a lot of times, the next storm is quite a bit bigger than the first storm, <laughs> right? Because God wants to grow your trust. You know, here's what's true. Here's what I know about all of us. We, we have a tendency in every relationship, including God, we trust Him a lot in some areas, but there's some areas we're not sure about. It's like, God, you know, man, relationally, I know, I trust, I believe. Uh, healing, I know, you know, when I pray, uh, you're going to take care of me somehow, some way, and I trust you in that area. But, you know, my money, I don't know if I want to do that, right? Or maybe you're really good with money. You, you've been through a storm. God delivered you over and over financially, and you're going, man, money, I got no problem. If God tells me to drop everything I have, I will, because he'll take care of it, because I trust him, and I've seen him do it before. There's a guy in, in, if you've never read the book, The Blessed Life, you should read it. It's by a guy named Pastor Morrison in, uh, in Texas, Gateway Church. He literally said, God, I'm going to try to outgive you. He gave away everything he had in the bank. He gave away his house. And he said, okay, God, how could you possibly repay me? Now, having said that, he has given away all kinds of stuff in his ministry. He's given away cars. And, and he's seen the Lord replace him. He gave that all away. He kind of chuckled like, Lord, how are you going to top that? That's really what he said to the Lord. And in his book, he says, the Lord get, called this guy up. This guy uh, this, uh, talked to this guy in Texas, and he said, call this pastor. So he calls the pastor. He says, so listen, I'm going, God told me to give you this plane jet that I have and that I'm the, the pilot. And anywhere you want to go for the rest of your life, I will take you there, and this plane is yours. I'll sign it all over to you. And he hung up the phone, and he said, it was just like God said, I got you. I got you. <laughs> and within a couple years, God gave him a better home, a new home, and replaced all the money in his, his, his account. Now, what, what's interesting about money is money's objective. It's not subjective. It's very clear what's happening, right? So it's empirical evidence. And so in this case, you know, if you give... If you give away a car, I've done that before, I've given away three, three cars, and I give one away and God gives me a new one, oh, yeah, yeah, this works. If God tells me to give away another car, more expensive, I'm getting there, you know. But I mean, if he asked me to give away the brand new one, that would have been hard, right? I mean, he asked me to give away the used one. You know, so then he kind of escalates it. But you see the pattern of trust that happens? The same is true in other areas. So you, you may be good with money, but you struggle with the healing part. Maybe emotionally, Lord, I just don't think you'll ever take care of me emotionally. My emotions are out of control. And, you, you, you know, we have areas where we struggle. And the point is this morning is that your storm, God says, I, I want to come in and I want to take care of this. See, we love the stories in the Bible where the guy goes in the lion's den and God saves him. The three guys that go into the fiery furnace, Jesus goes in with them, they're in there, he, they all come out alive. That's a great story. It's a true event story, and we love that. But if you're, you know, if you and I are there, we're going, hey, you know, I, here's my testimony. We got right to the furnace, and you smoked all those guys dead, and I never went in, and I was set free. That's the story you and I want. I mean, we don't want to actually walk in the fire. Now, it's a better story when you walk in the fire. We just want somebody else to have that story. We don't want to have that story. See, that, that's their storm. He said, but listen, when you go into the fire, I will walk in there with you and I will deliver you. What happens at that moment? My, my trust in the Lord is a whole nother level. Now I, I can look bigger problems in the eye and trust that the Lord's going to take care of me. But it is those storms that come through life that create the opportunity for the Lord to demonstrate his love towards you. This verse in Matthew 8, 23 goes like this. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. So they're in this boat. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. Now the tough part about this passage is how do you sleep in a boat 
when, you know, the waves are tossing and this storm came up. Now, I, I believe he was completely exhausted and I, I believe he needed sleep. Have you ever needed sleep, though, and your worries won't let you sleep? Amen. That's why you guys all take NyQuil. Amen. I know who you are. Amen. <laughs> Don't have to go public. But uh, no, listen, we worry, right? You're, you need sleep, but there's a storm in your life that won't let you sleep. But what if you go to bed and you feel like whatever problems I have in life, they're fine. This can be okay. You can go to sleep. I believe that even though this challenge was coming, this storm was coming, Jesus was saying, I need some rest, and I have full confidence in my Heavenly Father that we'll be fine. So I'm going to sleep. Have you ever met somebody who can sleep through the TV blaring? You can be on a four-wheel drive road, and they're just sitting in the car sleeping, and you just look at them like, what is wrong with you? And you're jealous because you wish you could do that. Amen? That's me. I wish I could sleep. like I'm not like My brother can just go out. And it, it's kind of, I'm jealous that he can get that much sleep that quickly. And, and I imagine the disciples are sitting there like, what's with Jesus? We're in a storm. We got issues, we got problems, and he's sleeping on the job. Somebody needs to wake him up. Well, you know, he, he kind of healed a bunch of people. He's been standing on his feet for 16 hours healing people and praying over people. You know, he, he's, he, he needs, well, yeah, we're going to die we're in a boat, and we're going to die out here. He needs to wake up. Have you ever felt like God was sleeping on your problem? Do you ever feel like he was sleeping in your storm? Do you ever feel like he's not listening? The boat's rocking, Jesus. You know, don't want to be sarcastic, but you can wake up and save us right now, okay? Just saying, you are, you know, Jesus. It, and he's sleeping, and so here's what happens. It goes to the next verse. It says, the disciples went and woke him up. He said, Lord, you, you got to save us. Everybody say, Lord, save us. Lord, Lord save us. us. Now, the time from when they went, he's asleep, to Lord, save us. What do you think they were doing? Dude, we got to steer the boat. Okay, you, we got to get to the shore. I don't care. Well, I think that's the closest shore. But you're blind. You can't see that far. It's this shore. No, we ain't going to that shore. That's against the wind. You know, you got all this sailor tart going, you know, and they all think everybody knows what you should do. Everybody's trying to steer the boat. No, we should go back. We can't go back. There's all those people. And, arr, and they're fighting. And they're trying to solve and fix the storm all by themselves. Can you imagine what that conversation was like? Can you imagine the panic and fear? But there's a point where they decided, we're done. No matter what we try to do, we can't fix this. And they finally get to a point where, I hate to do it, but we got to go wake Jesus up. And we got to tell him, we need, we need you to save us. This isn't going to work unless you save us. And you and I sometimes will go a long, long time trying to fix the boat, re-steer the boat, patch holes in it, break out your chewing gum, plug the holes so it doesn't leak. You know, we'll be halfway deep in water, and then we'll go, ah, you know, the water's here, and we'll go, oh, you can save me now. <laughs> I will wait forever before we go, Jesus, would you save me? Would you save me? Lord, I need you. See, see we don't like that in the culture we live in. We like, I could, I'm a self-made man, I can do whatever I want to do. If you set your mind to it, you focus, you keep your objectives, and you come up with a to-do list, shwa, shwa. Do you, you love to just, wow, got that one done, got that one done. I'm moving in the right direction. But we don't, on a regular basis, go, Lord, I, I need you. I'm desperate in my relationship with you. I, I need your help. Many times when I do marriage counseling, the number one thing that comes up in the phrase that's used is, I don't think he ever, he, he, that he even needs me. I don't even think, I think she would be happier without me. And it's in those moments where Jesus is saying, I need you to need me. I need you to stay in a position of vulnerability. But you can't do that unless there's a foundation of trust, right? I'm not vulnerable with the, you know, the guy at the poker table, right? He's trying to get my money. I'm not, you, I'm vulnerable. I'm, you're only vulnerable with the people you trust. And he says, I know that. I want to build the foundation of trust 
so that when the storms of life come your way, even the bigger ones later on down the road when they come, you go, we got this. I don't got it, but me and Jesus together have got this one. Can you imagine sleeping in the middle of your storm? You can't even imagine not worrying in the middle of your storm, right? Jesus was sleeping. They go to wake him up. They say, listen, we're going to drown. Remember, if Jesus tells you to do something, to get in a boat and go somewhere, he didn't say, you're going to get in a boat, we're going to go in the middle, we're going to drown, it's all going to be over with. <laughs> Jesus gives you direction. It's going to happen. And it's going to, from point A to point B, may get really, really rough. Yeah, but Lord... This spouse you gave me, it's not going to work. I'm going to kill him before we get to point B. I'm going to kill her before we get. This is, this is hard. This isn't going to work. He goes, no, it's going to work. I need you to trust me. But we're in a storm. There's, you know, you, there's horns on my husband. Amen. They're devil horns, okay? This isn't this. He's changed. He's, no, just hang in there in this storm and watch what I do. See, see, that's hard, isn't it? It's, it's hard. But when you get to the other side and he's been faithful, he tells you to do something, it will work. It will work. So he, he says, uh, he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? <laughs> see, the opposite of faith is fear, right? If you measure your fear level, you know how little faith you have or how much faith you have, how comfortable you are with God handling the problem or how uncomfortable you are having God handle the problem and he says why are you so afraid he's saying I told you to go to the other side we were going to get away from these people we were going to go get some rest why didn't you believe me would uh, did you see the storm outside <laughs> the water coming over he goes yeah I see it well we're gonna die who said you're gonna die the wave staring at me says he's I'm gonna die I don't know I'm just fearful I'm scared he goes I know you are he goes but you're not gonna die he goes I'm completely in charge of this situation you're going it don't feel like it <laughs> have you seen the water in the bottom of the boat it's like here now you were sleeping on the little patio thing we got like six inches down there you want it don't feel like you're in charge can I just be honest with you he goes listen I'm, I'm in charge and they had seen him heal people and they had seen some things on shore that were amazing. But they never ever saw them just look up at a fire all around Napa. They just go, be out. In Jesus' name. Just stop right where you are. Can you imagine being in that boat, all that water coming over, and you're complaining about Jesus not handling things right, and that why in the world you send us out here? And if you're so good, it wasn't a very smart plan to go on a boat in the middle of a storm. Or aren't you supposed to know the future? If you knew the future, you knew the storm was coming. How come we didn't walk around the shore? Right? I mean, you're just having these real conversations with him. He's going, to, I, I already got this figured out. Yeah, it's, it's not a good plan. <laughs> How many of you say, there's been a moment in your life where you go, this is not a good plan, God. I love you, but this is not a good plan. I don't like the storm. I got a better plan. Let me write it out for you. Here you go. If you could just fix it, that'd be great. And they're having that conversation with him. And they're in this storm. He says, uh, you're just, you're fearful and you just don't know what's going on. But I need you to trust me more and to live a life less fearful. Because Jesus is saying this, I've got some amazing things in your future. But I need you to trust me because I'm going to ask you to go. I'm going to ask you to go slay a giant someday. There's going to be a Goliath staring you in the eye, and I need you to grab your little stone and your little teeny slingshot, and I need you to kill him. <laughs> yeah, that's not a good plan, <laughs> right? That's not a good plan, God. He goes, no, no, I will help grow you and help you figure out when we get to that spot. When I ask you to do that, you'll have the confidence to do it. And we're just thinking, no, I don't see that. But, wait, but if you read the story of David and Goliath, you realize that he used that sling to kill a bear and, and lion. And he, he had seen God gradually take him through a relational path of where David had to trust him with a lion. David had to trust God to kill a bear. He just kept trusting God, and he began to 
have superpowers in Jesus' name. And then when Goliath came up, he goes, yeah, I can take this guy. In Jesus' name, I can take this guy. So Jesus says, then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. Now, we read through that pretty quickly and smoothly. But have you ever been in a storm? Have you ever watched the television for poor Floridians who always are in a storm? Amen. They've got those hurricanes that go through there, and you're just watching the trees bend over and boats up in the driveway and down streets, down in the streets. And I mean, that's a horrific storm. Can you imagine Jesus just going, okay, stop. Just calm down, stop right now. As I told you earlier, the only ones that saw that happen or recognized what happened and how it happened were the disciples in the boat with Jesus. And they look at each other. And do I have the next verse? The, the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. He, you see, there was something in the relationship that they knew about Jesus. And there's things about the relationship they didn't know. And Jesus said, I'm going to go deeper in my relationship with you. I'm going to show you what else I can do. And it's in this moment that, that you can imagine. Now, I would wish they would, you know, the Bible says they couldn't write everything that Jesus did because it would just be too big of a book. book. But can you imagine a, a week later, they're on the shore. There's lightning, thunder, and there's all kinds of waves. And all of them get together. Hey, Jesus, let's just get in the boat and cruise out in the middle. Let's do it again. <laughs> let's just get out there. And you just go, you know, all the other guys won't go fishing because they're scared and stuff. But I think we could go. Let's just slice out there. We're going to catch fish. We're going to make more money. We're going to go to the hot spot where we catch fish. And everybody fights for that spot. And the first one that gets there gets all the fish. But we could go with you. And then we get, and they think we're crazy. And then we'll get out there. And then just, boom, you smoke the storm. You stop it. And we're all just sitting there catching fish, and we just we just show them up in Jesus' name. <laughs> I mean, see that that's a whole crazy conversation, isn't it? But you don't have that conversation if you didn't go through one storm scared and fearful. It's okay to be scared and fearful, but but God says, listen, I don't want you to stay there. I want you in that storm to say. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. I'm not to live in fear. He says, the devil is the author of fear, and I am not. And so when fear begins to rise up, it will rise up. We'll see it, but God says, I don't want you to live there. I want to dispel it and get rid of it. I want you to trust me with whatever it is that's scaring you. And as this storm scared them, they said, Lord... We yield. We need you. We need you to get up. We need you to save us. And he did. And the Lord says to you this morning, he wants to save you from your storm. He also wants you to not be fearful of it. And that's hard. But you say, Lord, listen, I'm tired of being fearful over finances. I'm tired of being fearful over my children. What's going on with them? The protection. And that's a motherly, fatherly thing where I guess we're always kind of worried about them. But I trust you to take care of them. I need you to remove that fear. The fear of never being emotionally healthy again because I, I struggle with depression. The fear of a physical challenge that just won't go away and it's been forever and the storm's been going on for years and you haven't said calm to the storm yet and I'm tired and I'm exhausted. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you every hour. I need you. Would you bow your heads this morning? Lord, we love you this morning. And if we're honest, Lord, we, we, uh, we, we get fearful. And we know that you would like to give us these testimonies where we've gone into a storm, you held our, our hand and you walked us through the storm. And you didn't even speak to the storm. But you got me through it and I got to the other side and I was saved. There are times where you've said stop and you've stopped the storm in my life in a moment's time and it was over with and you delivered me. 
And in all of those, Lord, my relationship with you, the trust level went to a whole nother level. And I'm so grateful for that. But Lord, I, I remember all the whining I did in the middle of the storm. And I, I had to ask you to forgive me for that because we get scared, we whine, and we worry. But Lord, we pray this morning that we would be quicker in the middle of our storms to turn around and say, Lord, I need you to save me. Instead of wrestling with a God-sized problem longer than we should, that we admit that we are helpless without you. And it provides the amazing opportunity for you to demonstrate your love and your trustworthiness to handle our life problems. But Lord, we're going to need the courage to do that. And I pray you give us all courage of this morning to walk out of here this week and walk in less fear than we've ever had before. And that we would turn over all of the storms of our life to you. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.